Okay, um, good morning, uh, afternoon, or evening from wherever you're tuning in, and welcome to the Ethical Open Science for Past Global Change Research Coordination Network webinar series. Uh, my name is Natalie Rea. I'm a postdoctoral research associate in the School of Information at University of Arizona. Um, as an FYI, we're recording today's webinar, and the recording will be available uh, on the Neatoma Database YouTube uh, channel, and we'll put a link to that in the chat towards the end. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm tuning in today from Tucson, Arizona, which is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Thana Otham and Yaqui peoples. As uninvited guests and as a settler, um, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of these communities. Uh, I believe it's also important to acknowledge that the collective sciences that we represent today, for instance, geology, archaeology, paleontology, and biology, have, have been and continue to be used for the dispossession, appropriation, disruption, and destruction of indigenous peoples, lands, and culture, and to acknowledge that we have a responsibility to reckon with these past and ongoing harms and injustices. And so today, throughout our webinar, um, I encourage you to reflect on how this legacy manifests in your own work, your institutions and academic fields, and the lands on which you work. And today, uh, we're thrilled to be joined by three representatives from local contexts, Corey Rowe, uh, Ashley Rojas, and M Emily Th Santanam. Uh, they'll be sharing with us today some of the amazing work they're doing to develop tools to support Indigenous data sovereignty and cultural authority. And so I will hand it over to you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalie, and um, thanks everyone for being here today or who's watching the recording. We're really excited to be with you all. Um, I'm going to share our slides here, um, and we're going to start with um, team introductions, but um, the plan for today is to give maybe a 30-minute overview of local contexts, um, which are the labels and notices. Um, we're going to give examples of each, uh, talk about implementation, how this all works, um, followed by plenty of time for discussion, questions, and answers. So um, I'll start with introducing myself, and I'll pass it off to Ashley and then Emily. Um, so my name is Corey Rowe. I'm the Director of Outreach and Strategy with Local Context. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a settler. Um, I'm based outside New York City in what is today known as Connecticut on Wappinger and Pogasset homelands. Um, and I have been with Local Context about three years now. Um, my background is in museums and anthropology. Um, so happy to be with you all today. Um, Ashley, why don't you go next? Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Ashley Rojas. Um, I'm calling from Lenape Hoking or New York City. Um, and I'm a software and web developer for Local Contexts. I've been with Local Contexts for about a year and a half now and I focus on API implementation and uh, um, metadata implementation as well. So it's lovely to be here. Uh, Emily? Shukma, hi everyone. My name is Emily Santanam. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Americas here with Local Contexts. I've been in this role for about six months, and before this, have worked in museums and uh, curatorial and collections capacities. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation out of Oklahoma here in what's known as the United States, but I'm living and working on the lands of the Red Willow people in Taos, New Mexico. So it's great to be here. So before we begin, we would love to do a land acknowledgement. Um, our organization, Local Context, is based across multiple countries, so this is our organizational land acknowledgement. As an organization that transcends geographic and national boundaries, Local Context acknowledges that all of the lands and waters that we occupy are Indigenous homelands. We recognize the ongoing significance of these lands and waters for Indigenous peoples in the past, present, and into the future. Our work is focused on addressing the ongoing legacy of settler colonialism and supporting a more equitable future. So we do a land acknowledgement to help disrupt settler colonialism and also to recognize whose lands we're on as well as our responsibilities as guests here. 
Great. Thanks, Ashley and Emily. So we wanted to start with maybe a little bit of background about local context, um, where it started, where we are now. Um, local context uh, started around 2010 as an intervention to bring Indigenous cultural authority and data sovereignty back into cultural heritage spaces. Um, the traditional knowledge or TK labels were created through iteration and partnership with Indigenous communities around the world as a tool for that intervention. Uh, those were then followed by notices, which are tools for institutions and researchers, and most recently, the biocultural labels for biocultural collections and data. Um, we really started based out of universities, almost as a research project, um, so in the United States and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, but in 2022, we became an independent nonprofit organization registered in the Navajo Nation. Um, and as part of that transition to a nonprofit organization, we established an indigenous led council, which uh, is continuing to grow. And we also brought on our founding executive director, Dr. Stephanie Running Fox Johnson, uh, to lead the team through this exciting uh, new phase. So here's our team, which is made up of our council and our staff. Um, our staff is composed of a tech development and design team, an operations team, and also an outreach team. So as I mentioned, we are an international organization based across North America um, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. And we are mostly connecting remotely, but are occasionally able to connect in person for events, conferences, and training programs. So now we'll give you an idea of the widespread interest and application of local contexts. So here's a map that shows our global connections of communities, institutions, and researchers who are either interested in or already using the local context system. So as you can see, our connections are particularly strong in North America and Oceania, um, which is where our team has been based so far. We've largely been working in English, but are growing to support other languages as well, um, including other geographical areas as our team is able to grow and develop. Now, we'd also like to take a moment to pause and talk about the terminology that we're going to use when we refer to communities, institutions, and researchers. So we'll use the term community as an international way to talk about First Nations, tribes, bands, confederations, land councils, and similar collective sovereign groups with ancestral ties to the lands and natural resources, where they lived, where they occupied, or from where they have been displaced. So in following the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we recognize the sovereign right of Indigenous Peoples to self-describe and to determine qualifications for membership and citizenship. So when we're talking about communities generally, we're talking about common concerns and experiences across communities, because as we all know, Indigenous communities are not homogenous. Now, Indigenous communities may be represented by entities like TIPOs or Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, cultural centers, land departments, libraries, museums, colleges, and many other kinds of organizations. When we use the term institution, we're referring to organizations that are stewarding or collecting Indigenous data or collections. So there are, of course, Indigenous institutions, but we will always specify in those cases. And the institutions that we will be talking about will range across the GLAM field, so galleries, libraries, archives, museums, um, as well as into natural history, research institutions, labs, um, university libraries, and different kinds of museums of that sort. When we use the term researchers, we're referring to individuals who are conducting research or generating data. So again, researchers can run the gamut uh, depending on interest and um, research topic. So we use these categories knowing that there are many individuals who occupy multiple roles and affiliations, and our organization recognizes the many hats that people wear, uh, especially Indigenous folks who are working in these spaces. So we do strive to be inclusionary of that kind of positionality. So with that, Corey will now review a few of our foundational ideas behind local contexts. Fabulous. Thanks, Emily. So uh, we wanted to, to talk about some of the ideas that prompted the creation of local context with the challenges that Indigenous people see in data and information systems. So as this group will be familiar, Indigenous data and collections are held in libraries, museums, archives, and other institutions around the world. 
Um, because of the colonial legacy of how those materials were often collected, significant information can be missing. So this is information like community names that could have been excluded, not considered important, or might even be wrong. Um, this misinformation and misattribution continues to affect how communities are able to find their information and reassert control. Uh, because also of the way that intellectual property operates, communities are largely not the legal rights holders, uh, which leads to a lack of control and governance, um, which is an issue of sovereignty. And it's also concerning as some indigenous knowledge and collections are not meant to be open or accessed by anyone. Um, add to this that there's more researchers working with Indigenous peoples and data than ever before. Uh, much of this extractive or reductive research paradigm can remain in place. We know that changes are happening, but in this era of big and open data, the mistakes that do exist and those emissions um, are reproduced into the digital forms of the material. So with these issues, the Indigenous communities that our founders work with, um, we're looking for a way to intervene and interrupt these systems. So from this need, the labels were developed over about 10 years with communities. Um, later, the notices were also developed. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar, the labels and the notices are digital labeling tools. Um, they're markers of indigenous rights, interests, uh, cultural authority, and they can be used in a variety of contexts. So we've seen them used digitally in collections catalogs, archival records, apps, websites, course syllabus and more. Um, we've also seen a few uses outside the digital. Uh, we're going to start with our tools for Indigenous communities on the left here, which are the labels, and then cover the notices, which are for use by institutions and researchers. Um, after we introduce each, Emily and I will share examples of them, um, and Ashley will focus on implementation, how this works, and is being integrated into systems after that. Pass over to you, Emily. Thanks, Corey. So the local context labels support Indigenous communities to reinsert their cultural authority and sovereignty into spaces. Communities can use these labels to clearly state the provenance, permissions, and protocols of their belongings and materials. And they're a way to really keep Indigenous rights and interests with collections and data as they move through different environments, especially digital environments. So with that, we'll take a look at the different labels themselves. So just to talk a little bit more about the labels, um, they are signed by communities in ways that are consistent with existing community rules, governance, and protocols. Uh, the real goal of the labels is to support basic acknowledgement and attribution in these settler systems to start to disrupt them. Um, it's, they're also moving towards supporting indigenous authorship and access, and even further beyond that to indigenous authority and autonomy and institutional accountability. So when labels are added to materials, they become a visible indicator to anybody who accesses the material to understand its ongoing significance to the community from where it derives. So each of these labels that you see here has a different purpose, um, similar to how there are different Creative Commons licenses that have different restrictions on use, each of the labels has a different meaning attached to it. Um, unlike the Creative Commons licenses, the labels are not legal licenses, they are educational, they are extra legal, and they're not tied to who owns material. So as discussed earlier, um, this can be a problem because Indigenous people are not considered the legal rights owners of their materials. So the labels were designed to be flexible, um, so they could be applied to a website or collections database or more specifically on a single item of cultural heritage or a data set. Um, as you'll see when we look more closely at a few examples of the labels, some are a little bit more specific than others, and so we see some labels being applied across a collection, for instance, while others will be applied to a specific item or data. So we have 20 traditional knowledge, or TK, labels, and those are on the left. Um, and these are for use on cultural heritage materials. So the TK labels are identifying cultural material that has those community specific conditions around access and use. The 10 biocultural or BC labels, which are on the right, 
Um, those are really developed to support uh, community expectations for biocultural collections and data. So this is material that is coming from Indigenous people's lands and waters. Um, and so these labels are meant to support their right to decide how those collections and data are used. Um, and the label's meanings are related to these three categories of provenance, where something comes from, protocols, how it should be accessed, and permissions, how it should be used into the future. So I'll pass over to Emily to talk a little bit more about the labels. Great. So here we're going to take a look at what these labels actually look like, and we'll talk about one from each category. So I won't have time to go through all of the labels that Corey just mentioned, but if you are interested, I encourage you to read through more of those that are available on our website. So first at the top here, we have a provenance label, and this one is our TK multiple communities label. So a community might use this label if there are multiple communities who have responsibilities of custodianship, ownership, or stewardship over specific material. Beneath that, we have an example of a protocol label, and this one is our TK seasonal label. So this label is all about connecting knowledge and land. So a community might want to use this label if there are seasonal associations with particular material. So if certain songs or stories are only supposed to be told at a particular time of year. Finally, at the bottom here, we have an example of one of our permission labels. This one is our TK non-commercial label, and a community might choose to use this label if they would like the material in question to only be used for non-commercial purposes. Now, there is a TK and BC version of this label, um, and there's also a TK and BC open to commercialization label. So both options are possible. It really just depends on what the community is interested in. So every community can curate and customize their own set of labels. Um, each of the labels does come with template text, which you see here in the description, but to further support community sovereignty, uh, communities do have the option to customize their labels. So here we are looking at the TK attribution label, which is about naming and putting proper attribution back into records. So we'll, re we'll review the three main parts of the label. Um, the icon on the left here will not change and is not editable. So we just chose to keep the iconography constant, given that our labels are used around the world and standardization is useful for recognition. Now, the title, which here is TK Attribution, uh, this is a standard title name, which can either be used as is um, in addition to the community's name for the label, or oftentimes we'll see a community translate that title into their own language. The description here, as I mentioned, is uh, our template text. Now communities can use this text as it is. Uh, they can insert their name where they feel it's appropriate, and they can also write their own version of this description. Um, and the community really has that right and power to decide what to include in a label's description, which is an expression of sovereignty that adds specificity and local conditions around um, the meaning of the label. So now we will walk through a couple of examples. Yeah, so we're going to start with sharing the labels from the Scallops Band of the Stolo First Nation, which is located in what is today known as British Columbia. Um, so this is a screenshot of the homepage of their website. Um, and if you look closely in the top right corner, you can see the label icons. Um, so these are in place throughout the website, whatever page you're accessing. Um, clicking on those label icons um, will bring up the full label text. So um, this is for the purposes of comparison. On the left is the Scowlitz label, and on the right is the label template text for this particular label, which is the TK attribution. So um, you can see the Scowlitz are using the TK attribution label icon, um, but they have titled the label in their language, Hulkamalum. Um, they've also customized the label text to explain what this label means to them, which is about telling their story in their own words. Um, so by using this label across their website, the Scallets are labeling the information and stories that are being shared as their true knowledge and history. They're asking for viewers to use this in a respectful way and also to attribute the Scallets. Um, next, here we're looking at an online record for an eDNA sample hosted by Wilder Lab, which is based in Aotearoa, New Zealand. 
Um, these samples were collected from the homelands of Te Rauroa, um, which is an iwi or tribe in New Zealand. Um, and so working with the researchers, Te Rauroa added a BC provenance label to this website. Um, so by adding this label here, um, the iwi is making this connection to their lands and their ongoing relationship to collections and data from those lands. I'll pass over to Emily to do one more label example. Great. So this example here is from the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohicans. Uh, and as Corey mentioned earlier, labels were initially started out as digital markers, but communities have really begun to use them in creative and innovative ways outside of that context as well. So here we can see that the labels are being used in a medicinal plant garden and on related exhibition materials on the homelands of the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohicans. So the labels being used here are the verified, the outreach, and the non-commercial. Um, so it's really being used to mark that the information being shared um, is verified by the Stockbridge Muncie, um, is being shared for educational purposes, and should not be used for commercial purposes. So as we showed you in the past few slides, TK and BC labels are to be used and assigned by indigenous communities. But here at Local Context, we believe that institutions and researchers also have a part to play in this work um, and that they really have a responsibility to disclose indigenous collections and data. So to help with that, we created notices. The notices were developed to create pathways for partnership, for collaboration, and also to help support indigenous cultural authority. So as I mentioned, um, local context origin was really with the TK labels, um, but the notices were developed when our leadership came to find that institutions and researchers are on their own journey in this work, and they can do something to help make visible Indigenous data and collections so that communities can reconnect with their knowledge, their belongings, relatives, ancestors, and be a part of the decision making around their access and use. So the notices can help to disperse some of the labor that's involved in this work from communities back onto institutions and researchers who are often gonna have greater familiarity with their data and materials. Um, and similar to labels, we describe them in three categories and each of those categories function to communicate different indigenous interests. So first we have our engagement notice, which is the open to collaborate notice. Um, this notice is for an institution or researcher to clearly commit to ethical reciprocal engagement with indigenous communities. Um, this is often where we're seeing institutions and researchers start. It also can be used where you have those uh, existing relationships and commitments in place already um, and to really make clear that that is work that you are doing. Um, next, we have the disclosure notices. Um, so the disclosure notices are for identifying and sharing where there are Indigenous collections. So this is working towards that challenge of supporting communities to find and access their collections and knowledge. So there are three disclosure notices, attribution incomplete, biocultural or BC, and traditional knowledge or TK. The third category, Collections Care Notices, were developed um, within the past year in collaboration with the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Um, these were created for collections and physical storage stewarded outside of communities to make clear when specialized cultural care is needed. Unlike the other notices, these notices were specifically designed to be printed to physically label collection spaces. And these are also used after consultation with communities. The engagement and disclosure notices do not require consultation with communities and they can kind of be a first step if you like. Uh, we are going to show a couple examples of the engagement and disclosure notices. We are not going to show any examples of the collections care notices. Not only are these new, but they are a largely internal facing tool. So we wouldn't really expect the collections that these notices apply to to be public facing. Um, and before we go into the parts of the notice and a couple examples, um, just want to point out that there are fewer notices and there are labels. Um, this is because the labels are more specific. Um, they're being used by communities on their own belongings and information. Uh, the notices, meanwhile, are being applied by institutions and researchers who are stewarding those belongings and information and are being used to clearly identify the Indigenous rights and responsibilities are present, but not what those rights and responsibilities are. Uh, that remains the right of the community. 
So next I'll pass it to Emily to look at the parts of the notice. So now, as Corey mentioned, we are going to go over those same three parts, um, though unlike the labels, the notices will remain the same wherever they're used. So they won't be customized by institutions or researchers. Uh, now, we do encourage additional explanations and information to accompany the notices, but that main text in the description here has been standardized as a simplified marker of Indigenous collections. We do have translations available on our hub website um, for the titles and the texts in English, Tereo Maori, Spanish, and French. So with that, we'll walk through a few examples of notices in use in the real world. Awesome. So we're starting with an example of a database that's using an open to collaborate notice. Um, so Geome is a meta database. Um, it records details around bio samples and genetic sequences. So they're using the Open to Collaborate notice here on their homepage. Um, and by doing that, they're making it clear that the platform is committed to collaboration and ethical relationships. Uh, the platform has also built in a connection in their system that allows researchers to attach notices to this data. So the main center for genetics in the environment uh, is using the Open to Collaborate and BC notices on its main eDNA project here. So the center was founded in 2019 uh, to really share and widen environmental genetic research, particularly through collaborations and partnerships. Uh, and incorporating local context has involved the whole ecosystem of individuals and groups, including indigenous community stakeholders, many DNA faculty, researchers, and students. So they've taken the time to develop relationships and to incorporate local contacts into infrastructure and workflows. So here is their metadata website. And as you can see, they've included an open to collaborate notice, uh, but they're also using the biocultural notice on their sampling sites. So they have built the notices into the eDNA sampling process so that the notice is present from the initial stages of research. Our next example is with the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, and they're using the Open to Collaborate notice on the homepage of their website. So they're using um, the BC notice on their Lewis and Clark herbarium as well, um, which are the plant specimens that were collected by Lewis and Clark. Um, these of course were collected from indigenous lands and the records contain indigenous knowledge. So they're using that BC notice to acknowledge that um, but they're also embarking on a multi-year project to create an exhibition that centers Indigenous perspectives. So this also shows a different scale that notices can be applied. Um, while uh, previous examples were placed across institutions or research projects, this use of the BC notice is being applied to the 226 plant specimens in this particular collection. So this next use of a notice is even more specific. So it's on a single archival record at the University of Alberta Library Archives. Um, now they have included an open to collaborate notice in their catalog here. Alongside using the notice, they've also disclosed that their library and archives have an estimated 311 accessions with indigenous content, interests and knowledge, um, and that they're working to add notices to every one of these records. So here is an example of one of the 45 accessions that the University of Alberta has added notices to in 2023. So this is an example of a notice included in the credits on an archival record uh, that's available online, which again is uh, really to share that the university library is open to collaborate on these materials. So this use of a biocultural notice is also pretty specific. It's applied to the genome sequence of the bilberry. Um, this is a shrub that grows in Northern Europe. Um, it's been a significant source of nutrition for the Sami, the indigenous people there. Um, the samples used to assemble the genome were collected on Sami lands. Um, and so the international team of researchers uh, around this uh, placed a BC notice on the genome, which is hosted in this database, um, and to acknowledge the indigenous provenance and rights associated with the bilberry and this research. 
Um, this is uh, the same researchers. Um, this is the publication that's associated with that data. And so they also included the notice there. Um, so this was in molecular ecology resources. Um, and the notice icon was included in one of the publication figures, which you can see on the right. Um, and the text for the notice was also included in the data availability statement, which we've added a box around here. So with that, um, Ashley is going to share some specific implementation examples. Um, this is going to start to answer the how question that we can talk about more in depth during the discussion. Um, the how of incorporating labels and notices is through the Local Context Hub website, which is where notices and labels can be created and applied. Once those notices or labels are applied, they can be added into your own systems. So implementation can occur manually, adding those notices or labels into your own systems or automatically with the connection to our API. So we're gonna share some examples around that. So I'll toss it over to you, Ashley. Thanks. Yeah, so the first example that we have here is of a national repository for land care research based in New Zealand called Manaki Whenua Land Care Research. Uh, this repository opted for connecting to the Local Context Hub API um, due to the scale of their collections, which was nearly 700,000 records. Um, and in the hub, they applied BC notices to five of their collections that house thousands of items. And instead of having to manually apply notices to each item individually, they utilize the API to disseminate those notices based on the scope provided in the hub. Um, and from there, they used a geographic filter to identify the items within the different collections that were collected from communities' homelands. And in a pilot project with three iwi or tribes, they invited those communities to apply their own customized labels to the identified items that they, should they wish. Um, and when the labels were applied, those communities in the hub uh, with the API connection, uh, once they were applied by the communities in the hub, the following morning, they appeared on every single item that belonged to those communities. So this is just an example of how it kind of spread across the different collections. And uh, this is one item that has the notice for the collection, as well as the labels that were applied by Whakatohia, which was uh, New Zealand uh, iwi. And this is only one of over 1,200 items that now have Whakatohia's labels. And implementation doesn't just apply to front-facing labels or notices, but should also incorporate the backend metadata as well. So for the last example that I want to share, um, there's a plugin that was created for Archive Space, which is an archives management system. And this plugin connects to uh, connects an instance of Archive Space to Local Context Hub to fetch the notices or labels via the API. And this example of the plugin um, shows the notices that are pulled from that connection. But the part of the plugin that I wanted to show was actually done behind the scenes. Um, so the plugin has exports for different metadata structures available for the staff that are managing the archives. And the developer of this plugin mapped each of the labels and notices into fields for EAD and MARC record. Um, to specify the intent behind the associated label or notice that's applied to a data set. And this is new because previously the labels or notices would be lumped in with general rights fields or added to a custom field. Um, and although the rights fields are useful, they don't really indicate why a label or notice is being used. And often they're not the best fit because Rights are usually held for copyrights or similar ownership indications. Um, and then for custom fields, they may not map into other metadata structures very easily. Um, so if the data ends up being merged into other repositories, it, it, there's nowhere for it to go or it gets put into a general field that may not be referenced. So by mapping the labels and notices into more detailed fields, 
we start to add more of that machine readability to and actionability to them, to those data sets um, within different systems. So it takes away more of that human-based mapping um, and letting it go through the systems directly. Um, and so we're continuing our work with Mark and AD records, um, and we're currently discussing mappings for other metadata structures such as schema.org and also JSON linked data connect in connection with that um, and Darwin Core. So if you're interested, please definitely check out our GitHub repository. We're going to start putting in discussions there where once the mappings are more finalized and we're ready to share our recommendations, we'll put them on there and we are open to hearing what people have to say um, and uh, continuing discussions for other metadata structures in the future as well. So um, with that, we'll just leave you with where you can um, find more out and connect with us. Um, we have our website here. Um, we have a support email. We are on social media, uh, as well as we have a newsletter that comes out seasonally, so about four times a year. Uh, we also have um, some networks and working groups. If you are interested in connecting with others who are doing this work, um, we would love to have you join, and we'll drop this link in the chat as well. Um, but we'll uh, be happy to take your questions, ideas, thoughts, comments, whatever you'd like to share um, now. Yeah, Simon. Yeah, so I think one of the, I mean, this is, uh, this is awesome, <laughs> first off, and thank you very much for letting us know about it. Um, I'm really curious about, uh, so we, in, in with the Neotoma Paleoecology Database, we work largely with digital collections. So these are representations of physical data, but um, stored in a database online. And when we show the data, we have several different ways of doing it. So people can access it through an API. We have landing pages. We have like uh, a map-based um, search tool as well. And I, I'm sort of, I'm wondering about where the, where the TK labels should show up and, and at what granularity, um, would we represent them? So we, we've we been talking about this. I think uh, largely we are at a point where I think open to collaborate seems like the best application of of the labels, at least for the data. But would we would we show it on every representation of the data or are there some like are, are there sort of guidelines for where and how you represent these labels? and? Sure, maybe I can start with that. And Ashley, I'd love you to jump in as well. Um, so I think especially when you are kind of applying notices across collections at, at scale, um, we would love to see the notices associated wherever you can access that data. Um, and especially if labels are being applied by a community, wherever that data can be accessed, if those labels can also be attached and however mm -hmm. that comes through in metadata, I think that would be our ideal kind of recommendation. Um, Ashley, do you have anything you want to add to that as well? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a, that's exactly right. Uh, anywhere that the items are being viewed, whether it is front-facing or if it's through the API, um, having the, especially labels associated with each item, if that's how it's going to be viewed, or by collection, if the items are not going to be disassociated with it, then that's fine. So in terms of granularity, the item will always be associated with that collection. Having the labels just on the collection is fine, but when it gets to the part that that gets separated, we want to make sure that the um, labels follow that data because when the community is applying the labels, they're applying it for the scope, right? Each thing that's involved in that. Um, 
So definitely making sure that the labels are associated with each item in that sense. Um, and that's why I wanted to show the archive space example, like that metadata structure kind of to indicate, you know, how the labels can be included within each of those kind of uh, collections or individual items when it's exported. Um, and then, yeah, and then the other examples of the front facing, you know, on each item page, having those labels show up to indicate this is the what the community would like to say. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, Simon, keep, keep going. Well, I, I have a follow up, but I would like to give other people the opportunity because honestly, I could keep asking questions all day. As those of you who have worked with me before will know. I say go for it. Okay. Uh, so I think the, the follow up question then is in a data resource like Neotoma or, or potentially a museum, where you could have tags at different structural levels, how do you differentiate between that? So like at Neotoma, certainly at the database level, we would be very open to collaboration and you know and and doing things at the database level but we also represent data that is contributed by authors some of whom contributed their data in the 1950s or 1960s and so then at that data set level potentially it's difficult to say like yes so and so you know we we might not be able to apply that that label like open to collaborate at that level how do you differentiate between uh, or are there structural ways to differentiate between where the label is actually applied in an organization that has this kind of structural system? We all start this again and toss it to you, Ashley. Um, so I think like the open to collaborate, we usually do see that used at a higher level. So across an organization and across a database. Um, in that sort of instance, um, it doesn't need to necessarily be attached to data. We would like love to see that, but we do see it used in like footers of websites and about pages, those sorts of pages as well. Um, so that can be like a great starting place, I would say. Um, but I don't know, Ashley, if you want to talk a little bit more about like the different levels or layers that the labels and notices could be applied at. Yeah, so yeah, the open to collaborate notice is more like institutional policy is kind of how I view it, like indicating to everyone who's coming, we are open to collaborating with Indigenous communities on whatever data sets are in here. Um, but that being said, the way that the uh, structure is set up for the hub, um, an institution or researcher can go and, well, communities can create projects too, but then at that point they're applying their own labels to their projects. But if it's coming from the institutional researcher side, um, projects are created on the local context hub to indicate the scope of where the notice that the institution or researcher is applying. Um, so it could be a entire collection that is the scope of one single project. Um, or it could be three or four items specifically pertaining to a specific community that they apply to this project scope, which is then shared to the community. The community is invited to apply labels onto that project scope. And then those, whatever is within that project scope is what would have the labels apply to. So if it's those four items, because that's what the community is looking at to say, okay, these are the labels that we would like to put for this specifically. Um, because the communities can customize, we have 30 labels in total. They can customize as many as they would like, and they are meant to be general, um, written by the community generally to be applied across many different institutions, records, data sets, whatever the case might be. Um, and so the projects help to kind of narrow down exactly what it is that the community is saying for that specific item, collection, whatever the case might be. So if it is the case where you have one data set that's from your institution, um, that may be your own project as an institution with 
the BC notice or TK notice or whatever that might be. And then if there's another project from another researcher, let's say, that they add their own notice or they have communities that applied labels already, then they would both sit within your uh, database, but they would have different connecting points. They would have different project scopes. Um, so they can still sit within the same space, but they would just be handled differently in terms of what is being said on the, uh, the data sets owner's point of view, let's say, or the community's point of view if they've already applied labels. I can't see the name. I've got my yes. hand sticking up in the air, but I didn't know if I was actually next. So first of all, I want to say thank you. This is an inspiring project. I really enjoyed this webinar. I'm afraid I missed the first part of it, and I will confess I have many different questions on different levels, and I'm not an expert at the level that I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> um, so listening to this with many hats on, one of them is as an individual researcher who has, I, I um, create zooarchaeological data. And so my data ends up having importance for different kinds of repositories. So I know as I'm creating it, and as I'm working with the community that's helping me to commit, you know, to define the, the importance of various aspects of it, I already know that it's going to go out to different kinds of repositories. And I already know that some of those repos are then going to resend it in compiled formats. So you're, the part that I really didn't understand but thought was absolutely awesome is the way you um, have parsed out the metadata so that it will it can be picked up more easily. Um, so if I as a researcher knew that I was going to be submitting it, for example, to GBIF that uses Darwin Core, um, it, are there ways to, to know whether or not the labels that I'd want to apply would be picked up? Because we know how the Darwin Core works or, and if they weren't, then what would be my next best step to to make sure, because one of the things I always worry about with the big harvester um, diversity systems is that they pick things up and crunch it together and then they have a separate file that's metadata that says, please cite such and such. And there's 5,000 references, people don't pay any attention. So how do we ensure that that does get picked up in all the different places that my data might go? So I'm sorry if that made no sense on the actual computer programming scale there. <laughs> No, no, it made perfect sense because it's also something that we've we've been discussing, and this is kind of where that metadata discussions kind of started. Um, so there's a few different things here. Um, one is a good news that GBIF is already aware of local context, and we're kind of already talking with them about stuff like this. So um, at the very base level, at least, um, they are aware that having the local context labels or notices travel with the data is something very important. Um, at the moment, we don't have Darwin core mapping, but that is our kind of what we're starting to discuss now. Um, and so we, there's a technical implementation working group that we run and we had our first meeting, um, not our first first meeting, but one meeting that we started talking about Darwin Core and trying to look at the different fields. Um, so we're hoping to kind of pick up that discussion throughout the year and continue looking at what fields could each individual label or notice fit into. Um, and then after that, it would be on our end posting those recommendations and saying, hey, if this is being used for local context labels or notices, it sh this is how, you know, make sure that these fields are being pulled. Um, aside from that, my recommendation for now, as has been with other um, metadata structures that we haven't mapped, is having something in the rights field is still um, doable. And that tends to always be picked up because it is the rights field. You know, it's, it's not exactly what the labels and notices are representing, but in a way it kind of could be. Um, so for example, when we first started, 
uh, we there we did a project with the Library of Congress, and they applied labels to um, uh, Passamaquoddy songs, song recordings, and they put the labels in the rights field because again, there was no other field that it could go in. And for the longest time, it was sitting in contention with the um, rights by uh, which museum? Harvard's um, Peabody Har Museum. Right. And so, you know, it, it, it still sat there in recognition of these, this information pertains to indigenous knowledge and here's how you should use it or not use it. Um, and at one point, Harvard was just like, you know what? We will remove our rights, let it stay with the community. So now only the community's labels are there. Um, so even though the rights field tends to have that kind of pre-connotation to it, right? Um, for the mappings that aren't available, uh, that's our go-to because you know yeah. until until indigenous knowledge is put into metadata structures in that way, we have to make do with what what we have so far. Um, but that is kind of where that the is discussion pretty, is going. That would be ubiquitous, yeah, yeah. I think that so the Tadwick group, who the standards group that that works with the Darwin Core. Um, they, um, I'm sure you're working with them already. So they, they already have an extension that's for folk taxonomy and stuff like that. But having worked now with extension data, I also, you know, maybe just a, a slight caution that the extension data doesn't necessarily travel with it either. And that's where a lot of these, so Tadwood moves very slowly with, with changing the main core, but those extensions are useful but then you have to make sure again that they will travel with and be looked at by the researchers. So, you know, that's always my concern. <laughs> anyway, this is really exciting. Thank you again. Of course. And I will add, for example, um, when looking at the schema.org mappings that we're working on right now, one thing we wanted to specify was like putting the labels, let's say in the ethics in a field that implies there is ethical, like you have to have a certain kind of view when you're using these metadata structure or these, you know, data repositories. And so we're trying to find fields where it's specifically indicating this is why this is important and hopes that it, again, yeah, gets pulled in properly, so. I guess I'm I'm still wrestling a little bit with um, Simon's follow up question, like thinking about um, you know if 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 Neotoma were to put an open to collaborate um, notice on say the front page, and you know it, it makes it kind of fair game um, to you know if if there were a problematic data set say from the 1950s or um, I just, I'm thinking about it in terms of, does it point a database like that to needing to update uh, like a data data submission agreements in terms of the, what expectations the authors that are gonna contribute data should have. And I think that that's something that, that our RCN has certainly been talking about with the governance group. I think it relates to the governance, but I'm curious um, what your, perspective is on that, if there's any interesting examples of how how people have started to work with this. For sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something like, it's going to look a little different, I think, in every context. And um, I think just generally, though, um, by putting up the open to collaborate notice, you're kind of like opening up the room for that conversation and that connection and those relationships to begin that maybe do exist, maybe don't exist yet. Um, if you are a database and you are going to be including that on your homepage across the use, um, 
I would think it would be a good idea to include in your um, submission guidelines just to make um, submitters aware of it um, and like what that means um, so that they they know what the implications potentially are. Um, and, you know, I would say like, I think there's a lot of fear about what it could mean. Like, does that mean we want all data off or not available? That is not always what it's always going to mean. Um, there are some cases where the data should not have been public to begin with. Um, but there's a lot of cases where communities just want to have the opportunity to add their voice into these spaces. Um, so I think like sessions like this to kind of share about local context, what it is, uh, what it's not, um, and like the potential outcomes, which is to enrich data really, um, is really important for um folks who might uh, manage a database. Um, we always we have monthly information sessions and hub demo sessions. We would love, we invite, they're open to anyone. Um, so it'd be great to have you all join um, or any folks that um, might need to know this information. Um, so that was a little rambly, but I don't know, Ashley or Emily, if you have anything to add to that. Um, I was just gonna say, uh we've had an example of uh, a university doing thesis submissions where they added a local uh, the ability to add a local context project ID number to connect to our API and pull labels or notices associated with the thesis submission. Um, and if someone is doing that and they don't know what local context is or why it's even there, that at least, like Corey said, opens up that door of well, this is why this is here. This is why it's important. Um, if you do, if you are using indigenous uh, related data, like this is maybe the step that you should take um, in regards to that, so. Yeah, this is, thank you. This has been great. Um, just, yeah, following up on Natalie's comment, right? As uh, someone who works and manages data in Neotoma, I can imagine a system, and I think we're working on updating our, our sort of governance protocols to sort of match this or align with this, right? But, you know, if I'm the, the lead steward for the FODMAP database right now, not if I am, I am the lead steward for the FODMAP database, right? And so, you know, I can imagine now that there's an open to collaborate note, I think we, right, Simon, Jack, we do have an open to collaborate notice for the Atoma database. Is that what it was? What no, this? no. I, we have talked about it. We've just okay. signed the agreement with uh, open con uh, with uh, local context, yeah. but we haven't applied. Okay. We haven't applied it yet. yet. Okay, yes, it's in the works. <laughs> but so you know, so this is kind of, you know, so in the in the near term, right? If I can imagine a system where someone, uh, say, sees this notice, um, maybe uh, sees a, a you know, and, and potentially, right, the the BC notice could be applied to the entire database <laughs> given the nature of our database too. But I can see that, I think, you know, it's really trying to get down that process of, okay, you know, someone has um, inquired, sent an inquiry about a specific site or data set, right? That would, I mean, should be funneled to me as the lead. Uh, and then I would sort of do that do due diligence of like, okay, who was the actual researcher? What was the context? Are they available? Are they not? Right. And then work on our sort of governance structures, right? What sort of what that like notice internally upwards to our leadership council, but also then downwards to individual researchers as available. But potentially, you know, it might be a system where ultimately if nobody is available, like if the original researcher who collected the data has passed away or is retired, right? It, I mean, I feel like ultimately that responsibility sort of comes to me as the constituent database lead or me plus the leadership council as our sort of governing authority. But, you know, that's where I think really working through, I think it's exciting to think about how our existing governance structures do and do not align and where we need to go to make them to make that process smoother, so. For sure, thanks for sharing that. Um, absolutely, um, we definitely see the um, 
benefit of having cross-institutional understanding, yeah. accountability, buy-in um, to being really key to seeing this work happen well. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely um, really appreciate you sharing that. Well, I'm cognizant that we are just past the hour. So um, thank you so much, Corey, Ashley, and Emily uh, for presenting today. This has been fantastic. Um, and I'm sure we'll all continue to be in touch in various ways. Um, I think we have all the links in the chat. So if anybody needs any of those, grab them before you head out. And thank you very much.